Um, so I'm going to talk about the lasting impact of the French surrealists reading of Blake and the way that Blake is perceived in France. Um, little known in France before the 1920s, Blake gained visibility during that decade thanks to the post-symbolist writer André Gide and Philippe Soubeau, who was the co-founder of the Surrealist movement. Blake's popularity then experienced a steep rise post-World War II thanks to other Surrealists and intellectuals such as Jacques Prévert and Georges Bataille. Blake became a classic in France over that time period, Yet, it remains to be addressed what kind of classic Blake was turned into. The 2009 Paris Exhibition Catalogue states that Mad Blake became a central figure in the French pantheon of Anglophone poets during that period. Indeed, Mad Blake is an epithet used in the first paragraph of Soupeau's 1928 monograph. In Literature and Evil, which was published in 1957, Bataille addresses the myth of Blake le Voyant, literally Blake the Seer, stating that Blake's wisdom was close to madness. I want to analyze how French Blake enthusiasts of that era propagated a version of Blake quite different from its English counterpart. The Surrealists de-Anglicized Blake, claiming him as a forefather and assimilating him into the French pantheon. They favored the Blake of the marriage of heaven and hell, which they celebrated for its anti-clerical statements and visionary power. I wish to highlight the biases behind their reception and the way they still shape the French perception of Blake today. Um, so I will be starting with the myth of devilish Mad Blake and how that myth was constructed by the Surrealists. Um, the one who brought Blake into the spotlight in France was the post-symbolist André Gide, a central figure of experimental writing in the first half of the 20th century in France, who has been described as a French Oscar Wilde of sorts. Gide translated The Marriage of Heaven and Hell in 1922. In the foreword, he puts Blake on the same level as Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Browning, and Lautréamont was considered uh, by the Surrealists as one of their forefathers. So this is my first quote on the slide. Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Browning, and Blake are indeed four stars of the same constellation. Gide also called Blake a radiant Lucifer, praising his maleficent rays, and insisted that Blake knew that as a poet, he was of the devil's party. These remarks set the tone for what was to be the dominant view of Blake from then on, a devilish transgressor, he was, by the way, called a genius of transgression in the 2009 catalog uh, for the Paris exhibition, and a bard of the dark side of the human psyche. In that respect, it is worth noting that Gide's translation of The Marriage of Heaven and Hell appeared within the romantic collection of the Dadaist and Surrealist publisher José Corti, um, which you can see on the slide here. Uh, and at that point, the Romantic Collection had published mostly Gothic English texts, such as Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, Beckford's The Tech, and Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Christabel, and Kubla Khan, showing a preference for the darker and more dreamlike side of Romanticism. Kami, I, I have to stop you because we cannot see the presentation. Uh... Oh, you can't. Sorry. The slides aren't moving. Oh, they aren't okay, moving. Um, okay. okay, can you see them moving now? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, then I will just won't put it uh, full screen. Okay. Uh, right. Can you see the red picture now? Brilliant. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so perhaps one of the most telling signs regarding the French reception of Blake mid-century is the list of writers and artists who supported the Blake exhibition of 1947 in Paris at the Drouin Gallery, whose names appear on the catalogue. The list includes Cubist and Surrealist artists, such as Georges Brac, Fernand Léger, Henri Matisse, or Pablo Picasso, Dadaist and Surrealist writers, um, such as André Breton, Philippe Soupeau, Paul Éloire and Raymond Queneau, and for lack of a better word, absurdists, such as Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre, as well as other major post-war writers and intellectuals that did not belong to any particular movement. However, the majority are surrealists. 
The surrealist Blake is in turn matter maleficent, both a prophet and a free thinker. In his 1928 monograph, the surrealist poet Philippe Soupeau calls him Mad Blake in the very first paragraph. After Gide compared him to Nietzsche and Notre Dame, Soupeau paired Blake with Edgar Allan Poe. Jean Val also likened him to Nietzsche and to Rimbaud, another of the surrealist's heroes. Jean Val also wrote an essay on Blake called Blake, Pagan, Christian, and Mystic. The choice of the epithet pagan would sound odd to the English, as Blake is one of England's most Christian poets. This is a far cry from the French Blake, who was, and to this day, still is known best for the marriage of heaven and hell. Another founding text in the reception of Blake was Georges Bataille's Literature and Evil, which was published in 1957. The book argues that evil and literature are inextricably bound and centers on eight different writers that Bataille identifies as major writers of evil, among whom Emily Bronte, the Marquis de Sade, Franz Kafka, and of course, Blake. In the Blake section, Bataille stresses Blake's links with surrealism, observing the kinship between Blake and surrealism. Uh, he also repeatedly insists on the touch of madness in Blake, uh, writing Blake, who was not mad, stood on the threshold of madness, and this wise man whose wisdom was close to madness. This emphasis on Blake's madness also places him within the tradition of French poets maudits, or cursed poets, lonely, visionary, too strange to be understood by their peers, or tormented by violent passions. This is the version of Blake that Soupeau put forward, exaggerating Blake's isolation to make him look heroic in his pursuit of poetic vision. About Blake's disenchantment following the failure of his 1809 exhibition, he wrote, uh, this is the first quote on the left, after his heart struggles, Blake shuts himself away into the deepest silence, seemingly determined to let himself die and in waiting for death to roam alone the world he had tried to conquer for his contemporaries. Which, of course, contradicts the indefatigable energy expressed in Blake's poetry. Going further, Supo writes, indeed Blake never tried to make himself understood, never wanted people to see clearly, simply striving to see. This is going in the contrary direction to everything Blake says, even in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Yet Soupeau seemed bent on presenting him as a hallucinated poet, much like the surrealists who praised the unconscious and sought to trigger uncontrolled hallucinations through drug use, among other things. In that line, he wrote, Blake indeed seems a slave to his visions. All his engravings have the momentum of a sudden blaze following a meditation. Most often, that vision imposes itself without Blake asking for it. While Blake did say angels were dictating his poems, he did not mean that literally, and even his visions were shaped rather than passively received by his imagination. Um, through this myth of a hallucinated poet, Supo is making Blake sound like the French surrealists, which brings me to my next point, uh, which is the assimilation of Blake into the French pantheon. In the catalogue to the 2009 exhibition in Paris, Cécile Monsanti writes that in the 30s and 40s, Blake became a classic in France. In the same catalogue, Peter France writes that Mad Blake became a central figure of the French pantheon of Anglophone poets and even of great international poetry. He also comments on André Gide and how the latter was attracted to the Proverbs of Hell, in which Gide sensed the possibility of enrolling the English poet onto the banner of the Emancipators. While these statements acknowledge the Englishness of Blake, they also highlight a process of appropriation, which at times went as far as de-Anglicizing Blake. For instance, Philippe Soupeau emphasized how out of place Blake was in England. He wrote, England, the country of decency, that moral fog, saw the birth of strange and sometimes monstrous geniuses. However, none of her sons was more disconcerting to her than William Blake, Mad Blake, as he was called. As Soupeau narrates Blake's life, he also stresses and exaggerates Blake's alienation from his surroundings. He writes, Blake effortlessly succeeded 
in uh, cutting himself from time and space and severing all the ties that could link him to anything common. In doing so, he painted the picture of a decidedly alien on English Blake. There is only one step between saying Blake makes an odd Englishman and collecting him into the list of French poets. In Literature and Evil, Georges Bataille wrote, he is one of us, um, with italics. Bataille also related the anecdote about Blake purportedly being an inmate in Bethlehem Hospital, a lunatic asylum, a full story which originated from an 1833 article in the Revue Britannique in France, inspired from another erroneous article from the Monthly magazine in which Blake was called Blake le Voyant, literally Blake the Seer. The article stated that Blake had been an inmate for 30 years in Bethlehem and dwelled on his visions. While Bataille explained the story to be false, its very propagation fed into the myth. Moreover, the word voyant is significant in France when used by poets, as it instantly makes one think of Rimbaud's famous Lettre du Voyant, or Letter of the Seer, a seminal poetic manifesto which inspired later poets, especially Dadaists and Surrealists. The very name Blake le Voyant creates a parallel between Blake and Rimbaud and gives Blake a French air. Um, so now I would like for my final point to focus on what happened to Blake after the surrealist wave and uh, what he became. Um, I'd like to start with a political point uh, because the generation of students and intellectuals who avidly read Georges Bataille and the surrealists took an active part in the student revolution and widespread political protest of 1968 against the French repressive government. What is interesting is that this generation included Blake's marriage of heaven and hell into their protests. Indeed, proverbs of hell, such as the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, were painted on the walls of French universities, notably the Sorbonne in Paris, among quotations from other intellectuals such as Antonin Artaud, Jacques Lacan, Frederick Schelling, or political figures like Fidel Castro. The 68 generation was part of a literary and artistic landscape that grew with Blake, and they saw his revolutionary potential. The way in which they used this Proverbs of Hell to subvert authority is an interesting illustration of Mike Good's remarks in Blake's spotting about the Proverbs being radical speech. Uh, sadly, I do not have a picture of Blake's Proverbs of Hell being painted on the walls of the universities, but I'm sure they exist somewhere. Um, the way Blake is published, too, is telling. In 2011, Alia published a bilingual version of The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. So Alia is a publisher founded in 1982, which specializes in subversive texts, politically revolutionary or artistically avant-garde. It is worth noting that The Marriage of Heaven and Hell is their only text by Blake, uh, and that they have not published uh, other works of the big six, apart from, unsurprisingly, Byron's, um, showing their bias towards a darker streak of romanticism. This is also how they present Blake, as the forward states that Blake wrote a true vindication of evil and that he was eminently modern. The book cover uh, from Jim Jarmusch, Dead Man, is also in keeping with their preference for darker, underground counterculture trends. Uh, finally, the way we talk about Blake today in France is a long-term consequence of the surrealist construction. In the 2009 Paris Blake exhibition catalog, the poet Yves Bonnefoy made an indirect reference to Rimbaud. Bonnefoy writes, writing opens a place where the relationship between I and another might become clear. That kind of writing, which is a path, Blake, I think, recognized it in its specificity and brought it out in his work. The language here clearly alludes to Rambo and his letter of the seer, which you can be, see quoted below, um, especially the idea of I being someone else and writing as a path. The rest of the letter was also praised by the surrealists um, and it shows what ideas they projected onto Blake, where they were coming from. The fact that to this day, poets make parallels between Blake and Rambo shows to what extent the parallels made by the surrealists endure. Um, 
As a word of conclusion, I would like to point out that in 2013, one of Blake's red dragon engravings was exhibited at the Orsay Museum in Paris in an exhibition called The Angel of the Tsar, Dark Romanticism from Goya to Max Ernst, which um, spanned works from the late 18th century to mid 20th century and ended with surrealism. Blake's engraving appeared alongside works by artists such as Delacroix, Fusely, Monk, Odilon Redon, and Gustave Doré, placing him within a pool of decidedly subversive, even transgressive artists. It is significant that Blake should appear within an exhibition on dark romanticism, or romantisme noir, as we say in French. This is a common enough label in France, and as a French person, I feel that this label does not have a true equivalent in the Anglophone world, which leaves me to wonder on the distance between the French Blake and the English Blake. In France, Blake is a dark romantic. He's the painter of devils and the bard of unrestricted energy. While this is true in England too, there seems to be a particular French preference for everything dark in Blake, everything weird, demonic, dreamlike, in one word, surreal. It feels as if French readers of Blake dwelled in the moony night of Beulah that comes before fourfold vision in his prophecies. I'm curious to see what are the, difference, the different takes that the English as well as global participants here today might have, and to what extent your own version of Blake overlaps with this devilish, surrealist French Blake. Thank you very much for listening.